So welcome everyone on MS Translate. Uh, it is my absolute pleasure today to be joined by Dr. Terry Wiles, uh, who is currently in Australia um, giving a tour, which I'm sure you will talk about a little bit today as well. Um, now, a lot of people in our community will be aware of Dr. Wiles' work, um, but for those small amount of people who might not be, I might get you to start just by telling us a little bit about yourself and, and your journey and how you got to be here today. Sure. So I'm an academic internal medicine physician at the University of Iowa, uh, and I was certainly a very conventional uh, drugs-based uh, uh, internal medicine doc, and I thought uh, diets and supplements, alternative medicine were uh, a waste of money and uh, very ill-advised. But God works in mysterious ways. You know, in 2000, I managed to be diagnosed with relapsing remitting MS, uh, and I knew it that uh, disease is progressive, that within 10 years, half will become disabled due to severe fatigue, uh, a third will have severe gait disability. Uh, so I wanted to treat my disease aggressively, which I did. I sought out the best MS research center in the U.S., saw their best people, took the newest drugs, and still went steadily downhill for the next seven years. Uh, I took uh, myosantrone, I took Tizabri, I was thrilled to take Tizabri, but continued to go downhill, I was in the sort of reclined wheelchair. Um, I, uh, I got turned on to the paleo diet, and so after 20 years of being a low-fat vegetarian, I went back to eating meat, uh, gave up all grains, all dairy, all legumes, and continued to go downhill, but I stayed with it because at least I was doing something, mm -hmm. uh, and the science seemed to make sense. Um, and, and then, because I could tell I was headed towards becoming bedridden, possibly demented, I started reading the basic science and would eventually start reading about uh, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, Huntington's, uh, ALS, and of course the animal models for MS, uh, and decide that mitochondria were the key driver and I needed to create a supplement cocktail to help my mitochondria, which did help with the fatigue, but I continued you know, to slowly get worse. By 2007, I could not sit up as we are now. Yeah. Uh, it would be a struggle to walk uh, across the room using uh, two walking sticks. Uh, I had severe neuropathic pain that was very difficult to control. I was beginning to have problems with brain fog. Uh, and my chief of staff, after having redesigned my job many times, told me that he was assigning me to the traumatic brain injury clinic in six months, and I'd be seeing patients without residents. Mm -hmm. And I knew that was a job I couldn't do. But, you know, fortunately, I uh, uh, discovered the Institute for Functional Medicine. I took their course on neuroprotection, had some more ideas, more supplements that I, I added. And then I had another really, really big idea, which is I should take this list of nutrients I knew were really important um, for my brain and my mitochondria and figure out where they were in the food supply. Uh, and so I redesigned my uh, ancestral health diet. Uh, along these key nutrients. Uh, I really paid more attention to my meditation. I uh, continued with my uh, exercise, my physical therapy program. And you know, when I redesigned my diet, it was, it was magical. Mm -hmm. uh, within the year, I was up walking again. Uh, I did not uh, require a cane or walking sticks. And I was on my bike again. I was able to do uh, basically a 20 mile bike ride, so I suppose that must be about 40 kilometers. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I certainly understood uh, disease and health very differently. My uh, chief of medicine uh, called me and he encouraged me to uh, uh, get a case report written, then encouraged me to uh, shift my research uh, into a small clinical trial to test the safety and efficacy of what I had done for myself. Um, so we did that, and with some help from the Canadians, who were my early funders, we did that clinical trial with uh, marvelous results. Uh, and now I've done uh, some additional small trials, and we have a much larger study uh, underway. Mm -hmm. So so now this is the, the way I practice medicine. This is uh, the type of clinics I run. I ran at the VA for several years uh, in the private clinic uh, that I run now. And now is the entire focus of the research that I do, diet and lifestyle. Fantastic, and I, I think, so listening to that, there's a couple of key points that, that you brought up in terms of, one, what you're doing is underpinned by science, but two, back when, when you were practicing and still practicing, but back before all of this, you thought that diet and lifestyle modifications were a waste of time, and, and that's probably from what we hear in the community, still the per pervasive sort of nature of yes. how people view this, and so 
you mentioned that um, now you are going to be working on a, a large clinical trial, and I think it was in 2016 the US National MS Society gave you a, a $1 million, roughly $1 million grant to do this, $1.5 million grant to do this. Um, so can you talk to us a little bit about that, that clinical trial, where it's at, how yeah. it's going to work? So uh, what we're doing is, um, this is a randomized trial, it's prospective, so uh, we're using a low saturated fat diet and uh, the Walls diet. Uh, and what we're doing is we have a 12 week observation period where people eat the, the usual diet uh, and we do 24 hour uh, food r records to know what they're eating and we can do a very detailed analysis of that. Then we randomize them and train them either in the low saturated fat diet or the Walls diet and give them a lot of support because you know it's hard to give up foods you love, eat new foods, things that you, you don't like uh, and, and necessarily. So we have to help them create new food traditions mm -hmm. and, and sustain those changes. Uh, then we observe them for 12 weeks, repeat all the assessments again, and then with a little less support, observe them for another 12 weeks to see uh, if they can sustain this. Mm -hmm. and, and we're looking at uh, motor functions, uh, visual functions, uh, quality of life measures, uh, and then we're looking at uh, nu nutrients, of course, uh, food records, uh, and um, we have, have some philanthropic support, so we're also collecting poop. And so okay. we're we'll be looking at the microbiome changes, and I'm okay. very, very excited about that as well. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a huge area that's really now starting to yield some really interesting results in, in different places. You know, and the other thing that's really exciting about that, Brett, is uh, as we're understanding the basic science behind epigenetic changes and the microbiome changes, and I, I, uh, we can talk about the mechanisms by how food makes such a powerful impact mm -hmm. on uh, uh, immune health, uh, brain uh, physiology, that people are beginning to say, well, it does matter what you eat. Uh, and uh, so in, in, the, in the clinical studies, in the basic science, you know, I've gone from being sort of viewed with a lot of skepticism to now at the university being seen as this brilliant visionary uh, in that food uh, is so powerful. And now I have my uh, colleagues uh, asking to join my lab so they can uh, help measure some of the things that we're doing with our, with our study. Well, no, it's fantastic that there's now been funding devoted to this type of work because for a long time this is the sort of research that wouldn't be able to attract any sort of research funding. Well, you know, when I first started on this journey and I knew it, um, that we need to do a safety trial, so there's certainly many uh, at the university who were, uh, thought I was being very foolish that I should be working on a single molecular pathway, pick one nutrient. Uh, and fortunately, uh, the chair of medicine had become the dean of the College of Medicine, called me and said, oh, no, no, you're right. We need to see, can people implement what you did? Because what you did is so remarkable that the first thing you have to do is just copy what you did. Mm -hmm. And then we can break this down a bit more. Uh, and so he was very, much, very, very supportive of this multimodal intervention. And, and, and then, you know, when I published my, uh, my book, The Walls Protocol, it created the, this, um, dramatic uptick in interest and awareness in the autoimmune community about the impact of diet and lifestyle. That created uh, public pressure uh, for the constituents of the, of the U.S. The MS Society to realize that they needed to make wellness, mm -hmm. diet and lifestyle, a, an important research priority. Yeah. So, you know, uh, I think people uh, um, underappreciate their power as constituents of these nonprofits. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, I mean, that's certainly something that I try and push quite a bit through MS Translate is the power of the MS community, and this this applies to all sort of health communities in general to actually push for change. And, and as you say, it sounds like this has certainly been something that's happened in this case. Uh, it sort of has happened in this case, and it's also helping uh, with the clinicians mm -hmm. because uh, you don't need your physicians, your your specialist permission to eat vegetables. Yeah. You can certainly work with your primary care doctor to say, look. I really want to uh, ramp up the vegetables the way that Dr. Walls is talking about. I, I want to work on a stress uh, reducing strategy like Dr. Walls talks about. And, and would you send me to a physical therapist to make sure I'm optimizing my uh, uh, balance and strength training program? Mm -hmm. These are things that should be widely accessible that you, that you don't necessarily need your specialist to endorse. Yeah. Vegetables are a pretty safe intervention. Yeah, and, and again, I mean, we've talked about this a bit before when we've talked about dietary modifications and talking about the need for clinical trials and I think uh, you can give me your opinion on this. I personally when we're talking about a lot of these things 
we're talking about having a healthier lifestyle and there aren't any negatives in terms of eating more vegetables as you say primarily do you think that the outcomes of this in terms of the benefits that we see is to try and get a shift within the healthcare community to make them realize that based on this they should be promoting this more with their people or so so i think uh, change has has to happen on multiple levels mm-hmm. um so i have this radical belief that it's my job to educate the public the lay public so that's why i uh, write books that's share why that in common um, <laughs> you know I, I write books for the public i do events like i'm doing with uh, mm-hmm. tara king with the transform your health tour um, that's why I, I, I run events for the public. But I also want to change clinical practice. Mm-hmm. So that's why I, I write research papers and mm-hmm. I write grants and I do research. Both need to happen. Um, and the more the public demands and asks for healthcare practitioners and health coaches to help them in this journey, uh, the better for them. Because they can't wait. That you know, it, It'll take another two years for me to finish my study, another year to write it up, so it'll be three years before this comes out. I'm writing more grants, mm-hmm. uh, the, um, uh, and I want to uh, ultimately be able to do a diet versus usual care study. Mm-hmm. Um, th- this all takes time. Yeah. People can wait, and many people will choose to wait, but others don't want to wait. They want to start doing everything that they possibly can right now to give them the best chance of protecting their brain. Yeah. In both both strategies are entirely appropriate. Yeah, and I think that's one of one of the important parts of this, and why it has really caused so much engagement throughout the community. Is it allows people to take a bit more control over over what they're experiencing. We talk a lot about through MS Translate. We talk a lot about basic science, and often having to put things into context. We say, you know, whether this leads anywhere, this is ten to fifteen years down the track, but. What we're talking about here are things that people can be doing every right. day to really help themselves. And what we're talking about really is something called learned helplessness, Brett. Mm-hmm. So if, if I'm going to uh, go see my physicians and take the newest, latest drugs and put all of my responsibility for my health on you as the treating physician, I, and I own noth- nothing, mm-hmm. then I'm uh, becoming dependent and helpless. But if I realize that I'm going to take drugs or not, according to you know my own personal feelings on that, but I also decide... I'm going to do everything that's under my control. So I'm going to make sure I have the most nutrient-dense diet possible. I'm going to make sure that I am doing something to address uh, the chronic stress. I'm going to make sure I'm doing something that I can to address uh, the toxin loads. Uh, so there's so much that I can do, uh, and that's uh, empowerment. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I give up all my control and all I do is rely on my physicians to take care of me, that's learned helplessness. And uh, in many disease states, that's associated with uh, worse outcomes. Yeah. 